Thank you very much. Well, this is really a revolution. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, Dirk, and thank you to have come here. Uh, what are the, the, the reactions in the scientific press? Do you have uh, some violent uh, things or, or just uh, reflection, just agreement, just silence? What? Well, it's very, uh, we got a lot of very positive responses. Uh, um, we got a lot of questions, of course, which yeah. I think is uh, absolutely fair, like is the method robust and so on and so forth. There were some uh, comments, um, not so much in the press, but more on like Twitter and so that were passed on to us, which were not quite fair, more down the line. This cannot be so because it's, uh, it's impossible. But I think generally speaking, uh, the response was um, overwhelming positive, as far as I can tell. Um, I know there have been lots of criticisms, but whenever I present at conferences, no one stands up and asks me or, or <laughs> faces me. So people just do this on our back. So, yeah, it's very interesting response. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Some question. Well, it's just a, a comment. Uh, maybe uh, Dirk does not want to enter too much into this uh, debate, but. Um, uh, in France, the, the reaction was not always positive, mm -hmm. so I can say it. Yeah, I yeah. can confirm. So there is a, a French school of prehistoric art that was, frankly, hostile. Yeah, we can say that. Yeah. Uh, and I think, uh, really, each time I spoke, including in France, with people who are really uh, specialists of um, radiometric dating and use series. They were all very impressed by the, the method and how solid are the results. And I mean, for me, there is no discussion. Okay, after we can discuss what kind of art is that, and um, of course, yeah. you know, if there are differences with Neanderthals, modern humans, the little uh, animal in the middle of the square, was it added after in the, middle Possibly, of the square, etc., yeah. etc.? Et um, but um, I think uh, you convinced, at least you convinced your department first and second, which is, was not the easiest. Uh, and second, uh, I think everybody who really knows something about you, series is absolutely convinced. I, I refer to my colleague in Collège de France, Edouard Barr, who came to me several times and was frankly upset with some of the reactions in the French uh, press or in some popular magazines or social media. We don't mind about the, <laughs> the press and the social media. Well. Uh, you know, in France, we love Cro-Magnon. And we were not, not happy since, since the, the, well, not the last century, the century before, the 19th century with Neanderthal, so it's, it's becoming better, but it's, it's slow. <laughs> uh, so giving this uh, possibility to Neanderthal is just a crime. <laughs> so, d'autres questions? Any question about, yeah. Um, with your permission, Mr. Chairman, two short questions. Um, one, do you think you could apply this method to microscopic calcite growth in fossil bone? that's growing in a dolomitic environment? Um, yes, uh, but you need to be sure that you're only sampling calcite, so that you need a little bit of thickness and you need to distinguish when you reach tissue, because as soon as you reach bone, that's usually the, the dead end, because um, bone just soaks up uranium from the environment. So if you have a minimum contamination of your calcite from bone tissue, done. Then you can't trust uh, the, the results. So you need to make sure that's what your subsampling is exclusively calcite. If so, yes, we, we can do that, definitely. Would you like to try? Of, yeah, I would, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's my two questions. <laughs> I'm well, uh, I mean, I'm happy to offer our ICPMS in Leipzig to try. Mm. Uh, uh, oui. 
Yeah, it's, it's more in the nature of a comment, actually, because um, when you make a breakthrough like this, which, which it's like a paradigm shift in terms of uh, scientific progress, uh, there are usually quite a lot of people who are not comfortable with the idea in the first place. And uh, thinking back to 2000 when we announced the discovery of Ororin, we had very mixed reactions, and some of them were extremely negative. I was called a maverick, which actually is not an insult. For a scientist, it's actually a compliment. <laughs> but anyway, the intention was an insult, but I took it as a compliment. Um, we were accused of publishing in a low-ranking journal, but the Compte Rendu de l'Académie des Sciences is an international journal, but it wasn't nature. So we were criticized for publishing in a low-ranking journal. This, it, it doesn't mean the idea was wrong or bad or anything. It just shows that the people who are complaining are jealous, in a, in a sense, or just unhappy with the result. Later on, of course, people go out and, they, and they, we found now things in, in Chad, in Ethiopia, which are more or less the same age. And I suspect in the f next few years, you will also find other teams going out and finding equally old paintings, uh, which will vindicate what you've said, I hope. And um, you will develop a skin like a rhinoceros, <laughs> so that all these insults and nasty feelings yeah. just drop away from you. So let's uh, leave it like that. <laughs> Thank you and, very uh, much. I just congratulate you for what I think is a breakthrough. And uh, maybe our colleagues will rethink some of their preconceived ideas. Thank you very much. Even if you had published in Nature, then you're accused of just heading for the head news or something. So that's what happened to us. <laughs> I can, can break through of, of a bomb you uh, no, I, just uh, you reminded me of something. Sorry to break in again, but uh, I was at a talk. I gave a talk in Coimbra, in Portugal, and I was asked exactly that question, quite aggressively, by one of the people after my talk. Said, "Why didn't you publish in Nature, Science, or PNAS?" And I said, "Well, we wanted to publish in a serious journal." <laughs> and of course, <laughs> everyone laughed. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah. As somebody said earlier on today, some of the ideas published in these high-ranking journals are not very good. Mm -hmm. They get into these high-ranking journals for reasons other than just pure science. I'm sorry to say, but that seems to be the case. Uh. Madame Senu a demandé la parole. <laughs> Merci, Monsieur le Président. Uh, can I ask um, a provocative question? Um, to your knowledge, what would be the risk of contamination? Uh, for the uh, samples. You, for to, uh, your, uh, uranium. Um, what, there's always a, as, as you've seen on these crusts, um, we are usually dealing with uh, formations that are not continuously forming, so they are getting dry. And anyone who's been into caves knows that there are actually um, dust sources, so you will always have dust. Then uh, if you consider again that what we are looking at are usually crusts that form episodically, there will always be a dust layer on the outside, and then the next episode includes that into the tissue. So um, it's quite common that we have contamination, but we can identify it because the contamination carries thorium, which is not the decay product thorium, but it's what we would call the common thorium. As soon as you have this, and you will find it when you measure, alarm goes on like, okay, sorry, this is not pure calcite, um, so we have a contamination issue. And then extra work is needed to disentangle the extent of how much this uh, changes your results, whether or not you can correct for this, and um, how much this correction would alter a, the age itself and the precision. So the precision will usually go nuts if you really have a contamination. This is exactly the case for the French site. The, um, um, the crust, very thin crust, is rich in um, detritus. It's not 
it's not over the place, but we would need to constrain this. That's one, and we only had a single subsample, so we would need to do a succession. But this is exactly, we then classify, in a way, the quality of results based on how clean is it, um, how many subsamples did we get, as, is it well behaved. And um, only when we are convinced on all these aspects, we would say it's, it's really reliable. Well, you know, I'm, I'm a member of the Commission des Grottes Journées in the Ministry of Culture in France, so I will try to get for you that's, some That's some good. We need, we need support there, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. I had the key of Lascaux for seven years, but unfortunately I give it, I give it back. Uh, uh. <laughs> Sorry. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me see. It. Thank you, Dirk, for the... Uh, uh, great presentation. You know, parad paradigm shifts are great to, 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 to be had in science. So even if uh, the results are going to be proven right or not, I think this is a way to go forward. So we should be uh, very happy about the results. I have one very technical question. I'll keep it for later because I may have been dozing off when you presented at some point because of my jet lag. But a question maybe for you and maybe Jean-Jacques can interject as well is, yeah, given the results, what does it mean to us and to our understanding of symbolism and Neanderthals and Homo sapiens would be the appropriate question. And I know you are maybe a geologist, uh, but you can answer that question or maybe Jean-Jacques can in interject. The question was? So what, what does it mean, given that the, yeah. What does it mean? I mean, at least um, the, the, the Neanderthals, um, who did this, they had some concept of um, symbolism, I think. Because uh, you, you go into a cave, you put your, your hand on a wall, you put some, some pigment over that, you leave a mark behind. So this is, yeah. uh, but I know there is a discussion going on. I would go as far that this long last resort of exclusive symbolism for modern humans is gone with this. Well, if I want to be provocative, I would say that experimental data shows that even parrots have a notion of symbols, but um, I, I think these this results, of course, are very impressive, and it comes with other results. I want to mention the uh, works um, in Brunicker, in southwestern France, that showed that to the surprise of many, then Neanderthals were able to go very deep in caves and do things, arrange stalagmites. Uh, okay, there are two layers. There is the, 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 the fact, I mean, what we see after, there is the interpretation. So uh, why they did that? Is it, you know, people came with the notion that it's kind of shrine or something like that? Well, I think that's, that's the, more a matter of opinion than a matter of, of um, of science, I would say. Uh, now, uh, of course, uh, some would argue, and argued already, that in fact, in the uh, spectrum of Neanderthal behaviors, we already have some kind of marks, uh, simple signs, lines, things like that. And that this, what we see in caves, is more or less the same kind of expression of marking the place, of putting your hands, of doing things like that, spots, things like that. Uh, to date, what remains is the fact that modern humans, again, <laughs> I hate that, but late Homo sapiens, um, when they moved into Europe, and this is visible already in the earliest origination, or very old phase of origination, they produce pictures, and they produce pictures of uh, animals or humans, uh, statues, things like that. They also produce pictures of imaginary beings. And maybe this is the, the, the main step, I would say, that would separate what we see in the Neanderthal records from what we see later with um, uh, modern humans. Um, I, would, I would like to add also that the fact that uh, possibly the oldest thing that we have in caves was produced by Neanderthals. I mean, these simple things was already proposed a long time ago by uh, Laure Blanchet that you mentioned, 
well, nobody, I mean, this was buried somehow, nobody <laughs> wanted to entertain really this, this question, but it's, it's, a, it's a old hypothesis that now is, is, uh, is, is, is proved to be true. So I think for uh, my friend Joao, really the next step will be to, uh, if he wants to uh, prove complete equality in terms of behavior with uh, recent uh, modern humans, will be to find uh, figurative art with dates of this kind. And I think that will be, uh, I'm, I'm not sure it will happen, but uh, that will really r make a full revolution. But already uh, proving that signs, uh, th I mean signs, simple signs that we find on other supports, stone, bones, etc., are visible in caves, that Neanderthal goes in caves, and that they use pigments f for pigments and not for some kind of utilitary uh, purpose, I think is, is a, a great advance. It's fantastic. Yeah, um, I agree, but one thing that I would also always um, put into consideration is A, um, of course the, um, the figurative art is impressive and it immediately kind of speaks to us because we, we know these animals and we can see them. When it comes to lines, dots or so, um, it's like if you put some Chinese lines there, for some it means horse, and there's a horse um, painting, what is the more elaborate thing to do? To come up with a symbol that has a meaning or, or put the, uh, a picture of it on the wall? So I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that the, the symbols are more or less, uh, I just we don't understand them. We, we can't really um, subscribe them to us. They do not d directly speak to us, but they could also be something like this. And the other thing about the paintings, I mean, well, there are about, I think, r roughly 200 radiocarbon dates on paintings. We've now provided about 500 uranium thorium dates on, I think, about 200 motifs. Mm. Thinking about tens of thousands of cave paintings, this is just such a small proportion, you cannot really say, based on this, that these and these only painted that or not, because there's just so much work to do. And unfortunately, we cannot just go and say, we want to date this painting, we are left to nature, where we find either calcite or we have organic pigments, but then we would be limited to 45,000 years and it would be either um, modern humans or uh, not datable. So it, it is, mm. I agree that um, the, at the moment there is still this difference, so we did not yet find any very old figurative painting, but I wouldn't exclude that we could find it. Mm. And I do not make this difference between the symbolic and the, the figurative art. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the fact is that in the archaeological record, uh, I'm not talking about uh, walls of caves, but what you find in the layers, uh, there is a, a, a huge gap uh, between what we see with modern humans in Europe and what we find with Neanderthal just before the replacement. Um, that's, I think, something we should keep in mind. Second, um, I think we have to be a bit cautious with the, the, the notion of symbol, because I think symbol is not just a sign we don't understand. A symbol is a, a, a sign that is systematically used to mean something. If you see um, a street sign saying wrong way, you know it means wrong way because you don't see just that one. You saw thousands of times the same red circle with a white bar and you know what it means. And I think this is what we miss so far in the Neanderthal record. We don't have what I described with Nasarius. We don't find a systematic pattern of reproducing always something similar. We have, you know, you could move back in time much before Neanderthals. There was this the discovery uh, that was made uh, at the Naturalist Museum in, uh, in Leiden 
among the collections uh, uh, brought back to Netherlands by Eugène Dubois of shells that has been exploded by erectors from Trinil and dated around 500,000. And one of them has a sort of zigzag on top. And people have speculated forever about what does it mean. Some people have said, oh, it's a, it's a symbol. It's a sign of something. Yes, I mean, we have one zigzag on one shell. Uh, and others have said, it's a game. You know, you open, you open shells to take the food inside with, uh, we think it's with a shark tooth. He did that. And one of these guys made chick chick chak on one shell. And it does not mean more than you know, walking on the sand and doing this with your hand. So I think this is the challenge in interpreting uh, this kind of evidence. I understand that the demonstration is, is really difficult, but uh, I'm sure that uh, it's much older than, than we, we thought. Yeah. Well, I understand that these, these poor shells of uh, Java doesn't, doesn't carry a beautiful drawing, but uh, it, it's, it's something anyway. It's well, it's not, it's, it's not very nice. Yeah, well, one before the other. Uh, I thought a uh, long, time, long time ago, and I gave this idea to the ministry, they, 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 uh, they don't accept it at all. Uh, I thought that uh, as uh, Chauvet is uh, something like 35,000 years old, uh, that uh, Cro-Magnon there, for the opening of the exhibition, could have invited Neandertal for just a, a drink. And this would have been for Neandertal a beautiful in inspiration. So, but uh, your, your, your caves, your Spanish caves, are much older for this sort of inspiration. So, I was very bad for, for that. <laughs> D'autres questions, s'il vous plaît? Yes. I'm sorry. J'ai cru voir un bras en l'air. Comme je vois pas très clair, dès que je vois un, un membre supérieur euh, se dresser. No more? Oh. Well, thank you very much. So, it's, uh, it's written general discussion. Is there any, any one among you for uh, a question, an idea, a comment on the, the general, well, what we call the general discussion on the, on the whole meeting, these two days of meeting, yeah. No? Yes. If you ask me, I always have a comment on something, yeah, well, so it, I don't know. It's a if it's a wise I idea to ask me, <laughs> No, I think one, one issue that came out, and I think it's, it's really a, a sort of uh, hotspot in the, in the research today, is this notion of uh, diversity among hominins. I mean, it's even in late hominins, like middle places in hominins. So how we can explain that and how we handle that? And I would say in past there was a trend to uh, there was different movements. There were people giving names of species to every single fossil they would find. So there was a um, sort of explosion of the uh, terminology. Uh, then there was a, a way, a movement backward with people saying, oh, we're going to merge everything. You know, we're all homo sapiens since the last two million years, you know. And, uh, well, it seems difficult to accommodate uh, things like Naledi in, in this picture or uh, even the hominins I'm used to work with. And in the meantime, there has been a lot of discussions about the validity of uh, the terms that we use, especially in the light of the advances in paleogenomics showing interbreeding between all these populations. And, um, and I, I, it's, it's a question that I face almost in every single lecture I give uh, in, to the public where people say, oh, but you know, if these guys can interbreed, they, they are the same species. And I uh, had this nice experience when I spoke to 
um, high school um, students in Germany and uh, this, this young girl came to me after and said, oh, if they interbred, they, they must have spoken the same language. Well, um, so I think there is a lot of fantasies about, about that. And I would say um, the, the problem we have is, uh, in fact, is a problem which is much broader than a problem for paleoanthropologists because what's emerging now, it's a crisis of the definition of species in general, and it goes much beyond fossil hominins. And this crisis, interestingly, has been provoked by the multiplication of the paleogenomic and genomic studies, basically showing that the, the biological concept as proposed by Meyer in 1942 is very difficult to, to use because uh, reproductive isolation takes a very long time to get established. In mammals, it's often a, a gradual process that can last several million years. And, uh, and, and plus, and uh, I would say importantly, uh, we see that in mid-sized mammals out there in, the, in nature, there is about 20 to 30 percent of the existing species that interbreed with others nearby. And so now we have biologists proposing other concepts uh, like the metapopulation lineage concept that has been proposed by the Kiros and others. And the general idea is that as long as you have an evolutionary lineage that can be identified and maintain its phenotype for a significant uh, length of time, we can recognize that as a species and that it's not, I mean that reproductive isolation is not the absolute um, I would say uh, yardstick to basically uh, define species. And I think uh, as paleontologists, we don't have to be, I would say, shy vis-a-vis -vis geneticists or other biologists, because in fact, each field of biology use its own definition that is, is most useful. So what I noticed, I know it's a long comment, but what, what I noticed uh, often is that people have no difficulties creating new species of um, Australopith, for example. Uh, we heard about a different group of Australopith in, in the Afar region, for example, sometimes with phenotypical differences which are not much bigger than what we see in the late Middle Pleistocene. Uh, so we have binobinal linear denomination for the older hominins, um, Australopithecus sediba, Africanus, etc. Uh, when we move closer to us, we turn to Neanderthals, modern humans, Denisovans, and we don't want to use any more this nomenclature. Um, there is no consistency in this. And uh, I think is, 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 is more a, a discomfort that we have in general with uh, diversity and differences when we get close to uh, extant humans and complex uh, creatures with um, a culture and a, a complex behavior. But our world of today is very different of the world of the past. And I don't care, we can call the uh, Australopithecus sediba the, the Malapans, like, the, no, I mean, why not? We can give them numbers, we can use barcodes, whatever, but we have to give names to all these groups because the amount of diversity and differences that we see in the past is an order of magnitude, if not to say several order of magnitudes larger than any kind of difference we can see in uh, living humans today. Well, uh, it's a large discussion. Eh? Uh, diversity, as you know, uh, we, we know that in paleontology since a long time, we are discovering the, 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 the extraordinary diversity in human as well. And it's a, it's a surprise. When, when, we, when uh, Homo florensis has been discovered, it was a fantastic uh, surprise all over the world. And uh, actually, we are just uh, uh, in, in front of the same sort of diversity, at least at a certain time. 
uh, that the one of the, I don't know, proboscidean, for instance. Proboscidean is a big, big animal, but the, the diversity of the proboscidean is un unbelievable. As soon as you have a, a small population, small population isolated for uh, a time long enough, you have a transformation, and you say that it takes time. Well, according to the, the people who, for instance, work in, the, in Indonesia, I remember the, the Dutch colleagues, uh, they, they think that it's, it's quite, quite fast, quite fast. Mm -hmm. I remember having discussed that with um, the different people, like Sonda, for instance, and uh, they, they say that it's a question of a few, well, Thousand, thousand years for yeah. the nanism, which is mm, maybe yeah. not a real species, but it's a real differentiation anyway. Look at the number of, of uh, elephants in, in the, the island of uh, Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a sort of uh, um, manip, manip. Mm -hmm. We just uh, make yeah. islands and put elephants yeah. in, in different mm -hmm. islands. And finally, after uh, some, some thousand of years, you have uh, plenty of new species, not very different from each other, but quite different anyway. Telephant is, is a very good example. Uh, there was a study that was published uh, about a year ago, I think, or a year and a half, uh, genomic analysis of elephants mixing with um, some uh, paleogenetics and showing that the, the species of elephants that we recognize today and in the fossil record interbred several times in the course of their history. And in the meantime, things that look to us very close, like for example, uh, forest and savanna elephants in Africa, has been separated for a long time and, and did not intermix. So uh, I think it's a fascinating moment uh, in, in, in our discipline to be able to mix all this evidence and, and basically describe this complexity uh, but still, I think we, we have to name things and we have to, and from my point of view, the Linnean system still stands because if everybody stopped giving nicknames to everything uh, in different language of us, yes, we can return to the 15th century and uh, uh, have a, a completely fuzzy uh, taxonomy. Uh, I think it's good that we have a definition, that we have holotypes, that we can give a description of what we are talking about. Everything is, you know, uh, open to discussion, we can change the taxonomy, but it's important that we are clear with what we, we say. Yes. Well, it's better to call you Jean-Jacques than uh, 388. Excuse me? It's better to call you Jean-Jacques than 388. <laughs> so next question. We are in general, yeah, please. Middle Pliocene, I think, is becoming a very interesting time period for um, hominin origins and evolutionary studies. Uh, as paleontologists, we usually look at, like, the, we use the paleontological species concept definition, and when we name a new species, we're expected to actually come up with differential diagnosis. And when you have characters that are different from those of a species that have that has already been named, especially when a species has been defined as having distinct features, and you get, you get something else that does not have those distinct features, then it's more likely that you're going to name a new species. So there are occasions like that. For example, when we named Alcelotus de Remeda uh, from uh, Oranzo Mille, uh, we looked at what has been described as distinct primitive morphology of Australopithecus afarensis. Now, do we have those distinct features in this set of mandibles? That's what we had to look at, because we, we technically compare what we have with what has already been named and assigned to a species. So by doing that, we came up with this uh, new species. The second thing is, I would like to talk about the Brutelli foot, for example. Now, that foot has a totally different locomotor adaptation compared to what Australopithecus afarensis had. And it, it's not really um, 
the right way to actually put it into our inferences when we know that this represents a totally different mode of locomotor adaptation. So there is some reason sometimes to actually name a species and talk about diversity. And I think the reason why diversity could actually be exciting at times is because it gives you opportunities to actually examine your so-called evolutionary lineages that you've been talking about for like three decades, for example. Now, we talk about evolutionary lineage during the Middle Pliocene, mostly Australopithecus anamensis, Afrensis, an evolutionary species, chrono species lineage, but what if that was not the case? What if there is something else better that could have given rise to Afrensis or, you know, things like this. So those kinds of new discoveries kind of, kind of give you the opportunity to test those old hypotheses and come up with, you know, new, new, new ideas so that you can move forward with the science. No, I think I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with naming species. Uh, I think where we have a, I mean, we have two problems. Uh, one problem is that um, paleontologists, paleontologists in general, have been struggling for a long time with the, the notion that somehow they should get close to the uh, biological concept of species. And uh, of course, it was impossible because we cannot test the interbreeding between extinct forms until we reached the point that it became possible to test it by paleogenetics. And then suddenly people came to this idea that maybe all these species are invalid because there is interbreeding and etc. And I would just like to emphasize that this is not a specific problem to paleontropology. It's a specific, it's a problem for all biologists, for people doing uh, birds, mammals, all sorts of living creatures. And again, I think there is a shift to the definition of species that would incorporate this, this, uh, these aspects. Then we have a second problem, and I think this is, I would say, more serious somehow. For all sorts of philosophical and ideological reasons, we have difficulties with the notion of different species of humans. I think it's fine when we are talking about osteopith or, you know, sort of ape-like creatures, oh, they are different species, good for them. But when we are talking about uh, the sister group of, extinct, of uh, living humans, like Neanderthal, Denisovans, etc. So then I think there is really a sort of blockade that we don't want to use terms of species. It's very clear in the literature. You see the shift. The shift is around 2 million. Everything which is before 2 million is named using the Linnean system. Everything which is younger than Erectus we fall in the, in the Ann system, you know, uh, Denisovans, uh, Neanderthals, uh, we found termination like that, we found all sorts of ways to avoid the linear denomination. Uh, when we started saying we don't want to speak about modern humans, we want to speak about Homo sapiens, there, were, there is a resistance. There are people who say, oh, Homo sapiens, you know, it sounds old fashioned. We, we prefer to speak about modern humans, even if modern humans is meaningless for the reasons I, I gave already. But I, I think this is, is, is just humans in general want to think on themselves as unique and universal, united all humans. And so it's, 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 it's fine as long as you speak about extant humans because we are all one species, we are very homogeneous, there, are, there is a, a sort of cosmetic diversity among humans. It becomes difficult when you want to incorporate uh, Pleistocene hominins because, yeah, somehow in our brain there is this idea that in nature, there is a ditch somewhere, and beyond the ditch, there are the others, and on this side, it's us, it's the humans. What happened with Neanderthals, for a long time, they have been on the other side of the ditch, and recently, we put them on this side, and so now we want to make them just like us, and the very notion that there could be even anatomical differences is, is, is creates discomfort. Well, I don't want to, to come back to what I told you yesterday, but uh, it, was, it was the same thing. In, in the 70s, when you say that uh, man is a mammal among mammals and that he was evolving because the others uh, have to evolve uh, also, it was not, uh, well, quickly accepted. And uh, fortunately, 
For the moment, we have just one genus, Homo. So that's, that's something. Yeah. Jean-Jacques, you raised something that's very close to my heart. For more than 20 years, I've been exploring the possibility of looking at probabilities, a probabilistic definition of a species. We are all using alpha taxonomy. Ernst Meyer gave us a definition for alpha taxonomy and we apply it as paleontologists. We put things into boxes, into boxes. When you have a sample of one, like Professor Raymond Dart had for the Taung child, the first Australopithecus, but historically first, when he had a sample of one, he could create a new genus and a new species. Now we have more samples. I would like to quote Buffon. Buffon referred to the, the nuances, the nuances of variation. Alfred Russell Wallace spoke of fuzzy boundaries. Amazing, he was perceptive about that and even Charles Darwin. Before 1859, he wrote two big books on barnacles. Barnacles, he defined, he, he was the world expert on barnacles. And he recognized that when he only had samples of one, he was able to define a new genus or a new species. But then he got samples of barnacles from all over the world, apart from what he had himself collected. And what he says about barnacles is as relevant to hominins, because as his samples increased, the boundaries collapsed. And I have read with great interest the two volumes on barnacles, recognizing he was himself agonizing over the classification. Could he really apply the Linnaean binomial system of nomenclature? Now, I don't want to, to boast, but more than 20 years ago, I wrote a short little item for nature on probabilities. And my passionate view is we should move away from alpha taxonomy to something else that we can apply in paleontological context. I'm not going to give my lecture on morph metrics. No, I can't. But what I can say is that I have made an appeal and a, passion, a passionate appeal to the paleontological community for a probabilistic definition of a species where you look at sigma taxonomy as opposed to alpha taxonomy, recognizing Yes, there has been interbreeding at some point. So sigma taxonomy is associated with S for spectrum, a paleo spectrum. As I was saying to Brigitte Sanu this morning, ideally, ideally, we would like a lineage to go from Michel Sahelanthropus through to Orurun and beyond through Ardipithecus into Australopithecus into Homo. Ideally, we would like to look for a lineage. If we were, hypothetically, to find a hominin at intervals of, let's say, 100,000 years, for the last 7 million years that represented the ideal to find the hominin lineage, then, Jean-Jacques, I ask you, where are the boundaries? We are looking at the spectrum. I completely agree with you. I think the taxonomy is much more easy, and it was much easier in past, uh, with a lot of gaps in the fossil record, because, you know, when there was only uh, Homo erectus, uh, Neanderthals, and the cro skull, skull, uh, it was easy to recognize the different groups. Um, uh, what we have been discussing uh, today about uh, Homo rhodesiensis, uh, I mean Homo heidelbergensis slash rhodesiensis. 
the problem is what the problem is uh, probably in 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 Eurasia we have a uh, an, I mean I've been supporting an accretion model for the evolution of Neanderthals and I think the more we have uh, fossils in our collections and the more we see that it's going to be very tough to put a boundary somewhere I mean right now in Europe we have a gap which is more or less as azotopic stage eight, we have nothing uh, as fossils. So conveniently, we put a, a, a boundary here. Uh, the day we're going to have a CIMA, uh, another CIMA within the isotopic stage eight is going to be a, a problem. So I think either we choose the option of giving names to, to lineages and, uh, you know, it's a, an alien system where basically you you use the split point to decide where you have a discontinuity, uh, but but it's it's a, no I'm I'm uh, you know I don't have an easy solution, but again I, I think I insist that we we should name what we are talking about and we should be uh, uh, precise about what uh, w w what we put under the names and and uh, I think my fear is that by wanting to avoid the issue. Uh, we start using what, what some of my colleagues do, uh, that give names that are, uh, you know, without, I would say, phylogenetic or taxonomic implication. Well, Francis, we, we, we know the limit of taxonomy, but uh, without taxonomy, it would be a big uh, paleo mess. Michel. Uh, I agree with you, Jean-Jacques, at least for a lot. <laughs> when you say it will be easy with less fossil, I agree with you too. I remember when I was a student in Sorbonne with Professor Pifto, we have few fossil few fossils, about nothing. But, as you tell us, at this time, we have a lineage. And now, with more fossil, we have no lineage. We have a tree, which looks like the tree of a lot of other mammal groups, not so different, not so different. And now, which is clear is that we need more fossil because there is a lot of question and we are not able to answer to this question. For instance, you say Denisovian. Okay, we know about ancient DNA, but in terms of paleontology, we know about few material. We need more, it shall be better. Soon, soon. <laughs> Okay, good. It's, it's gone. It's gone. Good, good, good. <laughs> and I think that there is a lot of place where nobody is working. Nobody is working. There is a lot of paleoanthropologists all over the world. There is a lot who has never, never go to the field and find a bone. Just one, just one. So we need more fossil. Of course, I know that. Not so long time, I was in Chad. And in Chad, it's a nice place. But now it's a nice place with not so nice friend. 
now to go to the Sahara when you are a paleontologist, you need to have with you a sniper and other guy. But the fact is, we need more fossil. And if you want to answer to all the questions you ask, and I agree with you, if you want to answer when you are teaching, when we are teaching, we have to say to the young people, it shall be necessary not to be an armchair paleoanthropologist, but to go to the field and to find fossils. I'm Julius. <laughs> Well, thank you. It's a beautiful conclusion, isn't it? So I think it's time to say thank you. To say thank you to who? I'm Sylvette, again? Again? Oh, please. So as, as a person who just got back from the field with some fossils, I <laughs> definitely support what Michelle is saying. And uh, if we indeed are going to understand the uh, tree of our uh, family, uh, we would have to go out and find the fossils. But at the same time, I think we also need to develop techniques, uh, uh, be it in terms of imaging and visualization and developing statistical methods and all of that. So we can have a comprehensive and integrative approach to paleoanthropology. Uh, so, uh, uh, for example, the new techniques that you've developed uh, in Max Planck and the amount of information we've ga uh, garnered from old fossils that were sitting there using those techniques has somehow revolutionized paleoanthropology. So I think uh, uh, as much as uh, myself, I'm a field guy, so I go to the field every year, and I also need snipers, by the way. You were right, yeah, I've been shot at five times, if not more. Uh, but we really need a comprehensive and integrated approach like any other field of science. So uh, I would encourage both the field person like myself, but also the armature scientists. <laughs> well, again, thank you again. <laughs> Well, thank you for, well, to all of you for having accepted uh, the invitation, our invitation, the invitation of the Academy, Pontifical Academy of Sciences. Uh, some of you didn't know what uh, was happening here, what was this academy, the existence even of this academy. So uh, I think that now you know more about, uh, about us. I'm, I'm very proud to be inside and about the, the quality of, of this uh, reception of this academy, of the work done here. And um, Monsignor Marcello Sanchez Sordo will say, of course, the last word. I'm sure. Thank you. Uh, the last word is also thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming. Thank you for your active participation. Thank you for the news. Uh, I think about my idea is to put the news that you put here, many news uh, for me. And uh, okay, this is a very important meeting. Uh, my concern is about the text. We need to have the text to publish this. So, you know, in my experience, because these new methods and new systems, and uh, uh, in the end, the people don't write more. <laughs> we need text, writing text. So uh, not only PowerPoints and other things of, or, or slides. So please uh, make a special effort to have text because the slides are very nice, but the text to explain this remain. remain. And today also this is the method. We don't have a new method to, to, to communicate, only the right things. So thank you, real. Thank you. 
And a special thank you for our academician and friend, Yves, that organized this splendid meeting. And really, I'm very happy, and I am very happy to know you. And uh, of course, the Academy uh, want to organize another meeting, maybe. <laughs> with family, with, with the family, yes. So this is very nice. Thank you, Riel. Thank you for all. Of course, I thank also my collaborators, especially Simoretta, to have a great patience yeah. to, <laughs> for the change, I think. Is she, thank is you. Here? Yeah, it's here. I would, would like to, to, to see her. Uh, 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 she wanted to talk, Ulysse with such a name. And she worked a lot, a lot, a lot for, for you. I received all the copies of uh, the exchange of uh, mail that she did with you, and it was a uh, superb, very big work, and not easy work, because you know you have some time, uh, your uh, airplane ticket, but uh, you want to change, you want to have uh, uh, some, some different sort of travels and so on, and it's a big, big job. Sorry, because no, uh, there are many changes in the Vatican, especially for Santa Marta, and not all people can be, live in Santa Marta, but this is because uh, Santa Marta uh, today leaves the Pope, and it's more complicated to have the places. And uh, many times the Secretary of State asked for the places at the last moment. So this is... Simonetta, uh, all people... Well, uh, thank you. this is... Uh, <laughs> a special, a special thank you for, for your work, and we know we, we know very well the heavy work that you you had, and thank you very much. It was superb, perfect. Everybody is here. After they, they, they can go wherever they like, but you came here, which is the main thing. Thank you. Thank you, Simonita.